Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to, to praise your name and to sing praises as we, as we worship you vertically. We, we edify one another horizontally because being a part of a church with fellow sinners saved by grace is such an incredible privilege. Lord, living life together with one another as we know of one another's um, battles and uh, the fight and to, to continue to glorify and honor you, the, the hunger to know you more, the, the longing to be more and more useful to you, the, the ache in our heart over um, unsaved children or um, agonies even uh, of relationships or at work or opportunities maybe even squandered with unbelieving neighbors and, and to be able to come and know, to see the strivings and to see the, the zeal that you have produced in one another in the midst of those circumstances. And here we are singing praises to you. It becomes an incredible ministry to each and every one of us. And so, Lord, you've designed that. We're just doing what you've called us to do. Thank you. Thank you for giving us these commands to sing these songs to you and to edify one another as we do so. And Lord, we just want to continue obeying you because you've called us to study your word, to read your word, to preach your word. And so as we direct our attention to your word, I, I pray, Lord, that it would be a blessing to us. It would refine us. I pray that it would help us and it would equip us for what you have for us um, in this world. We, we long for our light to shine brightly we long for Christ to be seen clearly in the, in the lives of family and friends and neighbors. And, and so, Lord, that can only happen as we direct our attention to your word, as we study your word, as we submit to it, as we seek to obey it, and as you give us opportunity even to share it with one another. So, Lord, glorify your name as we give attention to your word. In your name we pray this. Amen. All right, you may be seated. It's a thrill to be back with you. It's been, it's been, a, it's been a while. We've had, uh, the, April and I, my wife and I have had a few, a few trips, but I'm just grateful over the last three weeks, um, hearing from Zach for a couple weeks and, and Smed last week from Psalm 121. It was just encouraging and thrilling to, to see that and hear that. And you think about, you know, the, the time we had in Genesis 6 to 9, it was just incredible hearing those lessons. Uh, there's Zach, I'm looking for you. Just hearing those lessons, it was really encouraging just thinking about what, what um, uh, the Doe tribe got to hear and even hearing about man's condemnation, his plight without divine salvation and rescue and um, learn something new. I learned that God has all the bones and uh, that was just awesome, just good stuff. It's just thrilling. And, um, and just to, to, to brag on um, you as a congregation, it's just sweet to see the fruit of uh, what's pretty much about a decade of congregational labors for Papua New Guinea, and uh, that's just no small accomplishment. It's really sweet of the Lord, so thank you, and last week was a real ministry to, to my heart uh, here in Smed, do Psalm 121. I saw Smed somewhere, now I don't know where he is, but uh, appreciated that, uh, Smed, just just looking to the Lord exclusively. He, he, the Lord's our help, but he's exclusively our help, and he's the only one who can keep us uh, from evil, and that was just a, a sweet time. I, I do want to give you a little update on, on my travels. And not in some sort of weird way, like if I invited you over and started showing you scrapbooks and photo, you know, photo albums and family movies that you couldn't care less about. Uh, only because uh, some of my, my travels, some aspects of my travels are really encouraging for you as a congregation. And I wanted to mention, three weeks ago I was uh, at, in Dallas um, speaking at North Lake Bible Church. Um, Dusty Burris is a, a church planner. He was uh, a pastor there at uh, Countryside with Tom Pennington for, for about a decade, and uh, they planted a church up on the northwest side of, of Dallas, and they've been uh, meeting for almost, they're coming up on pretty close to two years, and Dusty asked me to come do a, a men's uh, dinner, uh, and I sp we ate dinner together, and then I, I spoke uh, on Friday night, and then Sunday morning I preached for the uh, congregation, and it was, a, it was kind of a reunion of sorts. Uh, I got to meet a lot of old friends who I didn't even know were going to that church plant. It was kind of remarkable. But one that you'll, uh, some of you might know, I met Clark Zimmerman, so Matt and Amy Zimmerman were, were here, part of this congregation, and they moved to Houston. Well, Matt's dad is at this church plant, so I met him for the first time, and 
he, he basically, this is his home, his church away from home. So now that, now that his kids have moved, he's just getting, you know, I said, you have to find new excuses to get out here and visit us. But it was sweet meeting him. He's part of that church plant as well. But what was really sweet and really encouraging was to see this church plant just flourishing. Um, April and I got to be there uh, and see the whole Sunday morning uh, uh, set up. And, you know, they're meeting in, a, in an elementary school. And, and as I got up to, to preach, you know, I noticed that the, there was dividers that, you know, could, protecting the uh, congregation from, you know, like the, 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 the children's library and the school cafeteria and all that. And so they have these, these little dividers set up with um, kind of a velvet curtain. And I was even noticing from the pulpit, I was noticing the dimensions of it. And it was just, it was positively Levitical. I mean, it looked just like the tabernacle. I didn't take, I didn't take the time to measure it by the, by the cubit and the span, but I'm guessing it's pretty close. And uh, so that church is just way more biblical than I would have even imagined. But I, uh, apart from, I, I was thinking, what, I was, what was sweet to see was just the church just so busy getting after it. And, uh, you know, they were, they were even showing me how they did. It's, it's kind of um, um, uh, two trailers full of, of uh, equipment that they set up every Sunday and tear down and and, uh, and I just was looking at this, this active, energetic, vibrant body of believers uh, that's, that's been a church for less than two years, and I couldn't help but think, man, this would be so sweet to see what, you know, what God's going to do at Gilbert if that's going to be something that would look very, very similar, maybe minus the Levitical tabernacle, but everything else, <laughs> yeah, it would be really, really encouraging. And um, so I wanted to just say hi from everybody at North Lake who, who knows you, um, and they, are, they love this church, uh, those who do. Uh, last week, I was, April and I were at the, the Devoted Conference in North Carolina with uh, several of our collegians, and Omri and Emily were there, and with Nishan, I, we had 10, there were 10 GBCers at this conference, it was a really, really sweet time, uh, so basically from Friday till Sunday morning, we had, had six sessions on Devoted to the Word, and I was extremely, extremely encouraged, and uh, it was just a sweet time in the Word uh, with all those um, collegians. Um, I think there's about 100, uh, 450 collegians at the conference, about 20 churches represented, and uh, two, the two TES churches from Phoenix were there. Um, and we had more people, I'm not bragging, but and we, we did, there's a few more people. Um, but we are definitely, uh, definitely glad to be back. Um, so finally, after several weeks break, we're back in the Gospel of Mark. I want you, I want you to grab your Bible and open it up to Mark chapter 3 verse 7. Mark chapter 3, verse 7. This is the beginning of a new section. And I want to read to you the story. It goes from verse 7 through verse 12. Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea and from Jerusalem and Idumea, and beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, a great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd, so that they would not crowd him. For he had healed many, with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God! And he earnestly warned them not to tell who he was. In the 1840s, Charles McKay wrote a book called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. It kind of became to be some sort of sensationalized account of economic bubbles and economic collapses because of the frenetic responses of masses of humanity who start having fears uh, and then they start doing things with their money that are foolish, or they start having greed, and they start doing things that are foolish with their money on the positive side. And it kind of became like a um, popular, sensational-level introduction to economics. Bernard Baruch wrote a, pro a foreword to this book in a following century, and he, 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 he writes this, 
all economic movements, by their very nature, are motivated by crowd psychology. And then he goes on to, to recount, quote, he, he, he says, I recall Schiller's dictum. Anyone taken as an individual is tolerably sensible and reasonable. As a member of a crowd, he at once becomes a blockhead. Or Napoleon's maxim about the military masses, in war, the morale is to the physical as three to one. Without due recognition of crowd thinking, which often seems crowd madness, our theories of economics leave much to be desired. In the body of the work, McKay goes on to write about man's discontent. And he says that man's discontent is really what sets him apart from um, the, the, the brutes. That's really what promotes civilized society, is that man is discontent and we want to make things better. But he says this, I found this interesting, three causes have excited the discontent of mankind and by impelling us to seek for remedies for the irremediable, have bewildered us in a maze of madness and error. These are death, toil, and ignorance of the future. And he goes on in his book to talk about all of the delusions of crowds and how foolish we get in our desperation to avoid death, to minimize toil, and to scratch the itch of what is unknown about the future. It's interesting that he talks about this as some, a piece of crowd think. Is it true that uh, man is reasonable and wise and is, as an individual and we just become foolish when we become a, a crowd? And I understand why you would say that when you're talking about ep- economics, but theologically we know this is not true. Crowd think is nothing more than the composite sum total of all of the unbelief of everyone in the crowd. And here in Mark's story, we see the delusions of the crowd. It's a crowd that is clamoring, it's fervent, it's absolutely fascinated with Christ. They can't get enough of Christ. Christ is withdrawing from them, and they are pursuing fast after him. He is absolutely, hands down, the most popular figure in the nation of Israel, and the people cannot get enough of him. Mark tells us, though, that this is not faith. This is just delusion. They are fervent. They are passionate. There's a fascination here with Christ, but it's not driven by faith. It's driven by curiosity. This uh, narrative, it might be kind of a, a sleeper story in a sense. It's almost like you, you read it and you're like, huh. You know, if, you just, if this is your first encounter of this story, if you, you hadn't read this ahead of time and you just showed up here and you got to church this morning and you heard me read it and you're like, huh, verse 7 to 12, okay. Jesus did some stuff and there's some demons, kind of like every other story. I mean, there's a lot of common denominators here. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, repeat. I mean, he's, he's got a following. He's got his disciples. There's a boat there. Um, he's healing in verse 10. People are pressing around him. People have been pressing around him since chapter 1. And there's, of course, some unclean spirits. And then clean spirits have been a part of this story since chapter 1. And so, what gives? In case that's your initial response, don't, don't feel too bad. That, that, that's, that's also my initial response when I read it. I'm like, huh, well, what's, what, what is going on here? What, what is the point of this story? Why is this story here at this particular point in Mark's gospel? Because it's doing some powerful, powerful work for Mark as he's telling us the story of Jesus, the Son of God. And so to really appreciate this story, there's obviously a lot more that's going on than just what meets the initial, um, initial gaze, the initial surface read. I want to do a little bit of review, because we are, as I mentioned, at the beginning of a new section. This is, uh, we're in the middle of, of what we might call Act 1. If, if, if Mark was broken into to Acts, he has four Acts. Each of these Acts has, has three scenes, if you will, and we just finished Scene 1. So what I want to do is I want to go back and review kind of the overview of the, the Gospel of Mark. I don't, you know, we get really exhausting to do this every week, but at a, at a turning point like this, it's, it's actually, I think, helpful 
So if you'll endure a little bit of review with me, let's do that together. How does Mark break up his gospel? Well, Act 1, I've titled A Shocking Identity. Mark begins his gospel by just showing how shocking Jesus' identity really is. My, title, my subtitle for that would be A Slave Who Is the Son of God. This is actually quite shocking because he starts to portray this picture of this slave. He's doing whatever his father tells him to do, and he is none other than the Son of God. This goes from chapter 1, verse 16, through chapter 8, verse 21. The second act is, I've titled, A Shocking Mission, and that goes from eight, chapter 8, verse 22, all the way through the end of chapter 10. And the shocking mission is the fact that by the time the audience, at least the disciples, start to realize, wow, Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, this is the Messiah. He's coming to rule, to reign. They're ready to roll out the red carpet, and Jesus is not telling them, get the red carpet ready. He's telling them, get ready to suffer. He starts to correct their misunderstanding about his mission, and chapters 8 through 10 is one profound lesson on selfish ambition because these guys are ready to reign. They're ready for thrones. They're ready for red carpet. They're ready for smashing Rome and setting up shop because the king is here. And my subtitle for that section is The Divine Messiah Who Came to Die for Many. Acts chapter 3 and verses uh, chapters 11 through 13 is, is called, I've titled it, A Shocking Reception, because the king shows up in his, in his temple as Malachi prophesied, the Lord whom you delight will show up in his temple. And he shows up in chapter 11, and it just goes off without any fanfare. It's like the clashing of symbols, somebody pulls the plug on the party, and nothing happens. It is the most shocking reception because what do they do to their king they they scrutinize him and put him under examination act four chapters 14 to 16 is a shocking reception a re rejection it's a shocking rejection because now here it becomes proven that the king is here he's shown up in his temple and he actually pronounces judgment on the temple by the time you get to chapter 13 so how do they receive him now they receive him because the subtitle there is a god receives execution. And these four acts really unfold the story of Jesus as the Son of God. And if you wanted to, you know, dig deeper into why I broke it up that way, you can go back to the introductory sermon on, on Mark. I kind of explain some of the bookends and some of the refrains. I don't want to repeat all of those details, but they're, they're, they're already recorded. So where are we at in Acts chapter 1? In Acts chapter 1, we're still establishing Jesus' identity. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 1, remember, that's the, the thread that ties this whole gospel together. It, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, comma, the Son of God. I mean, there is no more of a divine emphasis on Christ than the gospel of Mark. If you, if you want a real kind of quick and dirty summary of the gospels, Matthew is emphasizing Jesus as the king of Israel. Um, that's why his genealogy goes all the way back to David, the king, through a to Abraham, the father of Israel. Luke is talking about Jesus as the, as the servant, which is why he, the, the son of man, sorry, the son of man, that's why his genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. And then John describes, shows how Jesus is the Messiah. Of course, the Messiah has no lineage and genealogy because the Messiah is divine. And then Mark's point is he's the son of God. And of course, God has no genealogy. So uh, it makes sense, of course, that Mark and John are without a genealogy. But now we look at this emphasis in Mark on Jesus as the Son of God, and he starts by showing how shocking this identity is, that this man who shows up in Nazareth is God. He tells the human author, as we read the gospel, he's the Son of God. But you don't have a human affirming that he's the Son of God until the very end of the gospel. Chapter 15. And the centurion says, he saw how he, saw how he breathed out his last and said, surely this was the Son of God. And he's not even a, a Jew, he's a, he's a Roman soldier. From Mark chapter 1 through Mark chapter 8, Mark is still documenting his identity, and he does it in a powerful way. What he does is, he's already tell, he tells us who he is outright in chapter 1 verse 1, but he breaks up this section with three, with, with three stories of unbelief. 
And this is where I want to go back and start getting into a little bit of the details. The, the, the refrain of this first section, from chapter 1 to chapter 8, is unbelief. And let's just look at that one more time. Where does this refrain show up? Look at chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians as to how they might destroy him. The, the, the response of the religious leaders is one of absolute unbelief. Jesus is actually grieved at how hard their hearts are in verse 5. After looking at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he goes ahead and heals this man, and that just launches them into this plot to execute him. Chapters 1 through 3 document the unbelief of the religious leaders. Look at chapter 6, verse 6. Jesus wondered at their unbelief. Mark uses a word that means shock and awe. He was impressed. The crowds have been impressed by his miracles. They've been impressed by his powers, his wonders, his miracles. They've been impressed by who he is and what he's done. And here, Jesus turns around and kind of, kind of pulls a 180 on them. He's amazed at them, not because of what they've done. He's amazed at their unbelief. And who's the they? The there here. The there is the people of Israel. We are in a new section where he's moved from documenting that the religious establishment, Judaism, as defined and interpreted by the rabbis, has officially rejected Christ. They have set their mind to kill him. They are opposed to their own Messiah. Now, Mark starts to document the response of the people, the population, the populace, the crowds. How are the crowds going to respond? How's the average Jew going to respond to this individual, Jesus, the Son of God? And now he's documenting that. The last refrain comes in chapter 8, verses 17 to 21. Jesus, aware of this discussion they were having, he says, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Verse 21, he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? Here he's talking to his disciples. The disciples whom he chose, who are willing to follow him, and he's wondering, why are they not making these connections that I've been teaching on from the scriptures and from the Old Testament and from my own teaching? Why aren't they understanding? And so he's documenting, to a relative degree, some of their unbelief. So it's documenting a, a, an unbelief of the religious leaders, an unbelief of the population, and in the degree, even the unbelief of his own disciples. As we look back at chapter 3, verse 7 to 12, it becomes very important to understand this is Mark's first story talking about the response of the nation, response of the people, the crowds, the average Joe Jew who lives in Israel of that day. How is he going to respond? And so this becomes very, very important. It's also uh, interesting to notice how the story unfolds. I have a, um, a, you know, the title is Fascination and Recognition, Two Inadequate Responses to Christ, and so that really is the outline. The title is the outline. <laughs> Number one, first inadequate response is fascination, and the second is uh, recognition. The, the fascination comes in verses 7 to 12 with this crowd, and the recognition comes in verses 11 through 12. I'm sorry, did I say 7 to 12? I feel like I just said something wrong. Uh, if I, I'll repeat it in case, I, in case I did. 7 to 10 is the fascination of the crowd, versus 11 to 12 is the, the recognition of the demons. Both of these responses are totally inadequate. But here's where this outline is not helpful for you. These two responses are not equal. The way Mark tells this story is actually very profound. He's not really making any effort to document anything about the, the demons. The point of the story is not the demons at all. The point of the story is the people. That's his whole section from 3-7 to 6-6. To six, six. It's all about the unbelief of the nation, the population, the masses, the crowds in general. So what difference does it make how the demons respond? It's interesting the way Mark tells this story is the action sequence goes from verse 7 to 10. That is the story. If we watched Mark 
play the film. That's the story he wants to tell. What he's doing in verses 11 to 12 is he's actually giving us a background story so that we can make sense of the people. We don't even understand what's so lacking in the response of the people until we see an even better response, namely from unbelieving demons. Their response is also inadequate, but it actually surpasses the unbelieving response of the people. And he tells us that so that we can see there's something woefully lacking in the response of these individuals. So with that, let's dive in. Verses 7 to 10, our first inadequate response to Christ, is fascination. Fascination. It's not enough to be impressed with Christ. Verse 7, Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples. And a great multitude from Galilee followed. And it's interesting, the word great multitude is said twice. One is just the great multitude from Galilee. The second time a great multitude um, is used, it comes down in verse 8, and that is governed by from Judea, from Jerusalem, from Idumea, beyond the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. So you have two great multitudes. Now, why are there two great multitudes? The only difference, really, that Mark does with those two multitudes is they have different verbs. It's pretty simple, actually. He just points out that this great multitude from Galilee is following him because they're already with him, so they just stick with him. They're on him like glue. They are just following Christ. He withdraws, little retreat, get some time with the disciples. Nope, here comes the crowd from Galilee. They just stay with him the whole way. But what he's documenting with that second great multitude is interesting that he actually is showing that there are people who are leaving home and leaving their locale to come see what's going. I mean, he is the headliner. He is absolutely, hands down, the most popular individual in the nation. So the second great multitude in verse 8 is people who are not near him who are continuing to follow. It's people who are not near him who are leaving home in order to go find him. And they are from Judea, southernmost part of the southern half of Israel. From Jerusalem, the capital city, obviously also in Judea. And it's not enough that you have the north, Galilee, already with him, and you have people in the south, Israel, going to go find him. You also have a great multitude from Idumea, and Idumea is actually the nation Edom. So remember Esau, and Esau settled in Edom, so Idumea is, is Edom. This would have been south of the nation of Israel across the Dead Sea on the east, and then also south to the southern border, that would have been Edom or Idumea. Beyond the Jordan, that's on the east side of the Jordan River. On the east side of the Jordan River, uh, toward in modern-day Jordan, the nation, um, and that's obviously east of the nation of Israel uh, then and still is. And then he even says the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. And so Tyre and Sidon are up uh, north. Um, they're north of, the, of the, the nation of Israel. The only, the only people who aren't coming are west of Israel. <laughs> There's no land there. <laughs> it's just the sea, right? I mean, it's, like, it's pretty comprehensive. It's just every neighboring country has people who are so fascinated with Christ, so impressed with his miracles, so impressed with his wonder-working ability that they are willing to leave home, get their passport, even cross international boundaries, and say, we got to go see this guy. This is incredible. And I don't, I don't think I'm overpressing details because I was even fascinated to even read how Mark documented it because he doesn't just list out those nations. He, you know, he says from Idumea, uh, across or beyond the Jordan, and then he says surrounding Tyre and Sidon, which is kind of an interesting phrase because it literally is like not even just documenting people came from Tyre and Sidon. He's actually saying, no, it's the vicinities of Tyre and Sidon. And, I, you know, I was looking at that, and it was, it was actually fascinating to see that even the surrounding areas beyond the current borders of Israel in Jesus' day are also part of the promised land. And it's also interesting that even when David was reigning and passed off the scepter and the throne to his son Solomon, at Solomon's day, you have about the greatest breadth of rule ever established by the nation of Israel. And even un in Solomon's day, according to 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, even the kings of Tyre and Sidon still remained independent of Solomon's rule, but they, of course, had a peaceable relationship. And so it starts talking about the uh, commerce happening between those two nations. Uh, as Solomon ruled in the south, and they were ruling up in the north. And so it's interesting how pretty precise 
this description is of the promised land. And here comes the king. Here comes the seed. Here comes the Messiah, the Son of God. He touches down on earth, starts preaching truth, performing wonder-working powers to demonstrate the veracity of his message, that he is who he says he is. And people from all over the promised land are coming to hear. We are on the verge of a revival, are we not? No, we're not. Look at verse 9. He told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd so that they would not crowd him. And the, word, the, the, sec, the verb to crowd him is just a word that means to press in, almost smother him. You know, he doesn't want to get pushed off into the water and he, doesn't, he needs room. He wants to, he, he, I, 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 we, can, we can read into this a little bit. Mark has been documenting throughout the gospel. His purpose is to come and teach. He wants to teach. Let's just review that real quick because it's been a while. Go back to chapter 1. Verse 14 and 15, I mean, this is in the very end of the introduction to the, to the gospel. He's about ready to start his first section, and he tells, he tells us that after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel. And that was, that's what he did. He, he was a preacher. That was his mission. Um, the wonder working, the miracle working, the healing and the casting out of demons is entirely subordinate to that purpose. Chapter 1, verse 21 to 28, he goes to preach in the synagogue at Capernaum. Of course, he casts out a demon because he wants to keep preaching, but obviously even the people who see the casting out of a demon are more impressed with his preaching than even his exorcism. This is some powerful preaching. It is obviously preeminent. Skip down to chapter 1, verse 38. He said to them, let's go somewhere else go somewhere else. Why? Because everybody wants to get healed. They are knocking on his door every hour of the day. He has no peace and quiet, and he says, let's go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. He came to preach, not to heal. Of course, healing is just in his DNA. He's going to reverse the curse because he's the Messiah, but he came to preach. Chapter 1, verse 40 to 45, he heals this leper who is an unbeliever. He does not submit to his words. He warns him to go and make a sacrifice according to Levitical law, and he just actually goes out and he just ignores his command to say nothing to anyone. He goes out and blabs it everywhere so that Jesus, according to verse 45, um, could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. Skip down to chapter 3, verse 1. He entered into a synagogue, and this is the last story we looked at in Mark about four or five weeks ago. He entered into a, a synagogue, and, and there was a man there whose hand was withered, and he goes in to teach. He's, he's, it's on the Sabbath. No doubt he's to teach, but the point of that story is he's documenting a healing done on the Sabbath, which propels the unbelief of the religious leaders to want to kill him. And so you can see he, is, he has come to preach. In verse 9, it's pretty clear the desire here is to have a pulpit. People are pressing. There's so much demand, so much frenetic activity. He's not even going to be able to project his voice if he can't get some distance. So have a, have a boat ready to go. But it's also important to observe, Mark says nothing about preaching. It's important to notice what Mark does document. Why were they pressing around him? Verse 10, because he had healed many. He'd healed so many people. Everywhere he goes, sickness is virtually eradicated from that village. He's ending the effects of the curse in obvious and profound ways. Nobody Nobody doubts the authenticity of these miracles. He had healed many with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. I mean, <laughs> all those with afflictions? I mean, who in this room has afflictions? I mean, 
let's just you know leave the teenagers out of it. Uh, the rest of us, we're all gonna have our hands up, right? You know, it's like I mean, <laughs> you get to a certain age and you're just like, oh boy, <laughs> man, I hope I can even do what I did yesterday uh, without the pain. You know, well, like, oh man, three stairs, I'm gonna be swollen by tomorrow. Uh, you know, it's like w- w- affliction. I mean, everybody with affliction is coming to him pressing around him in order to touch him. Everybody wants relief because these miracles are legitimate. This is no showmanship. This is not some sort of sleight of hand. Actual miracles. People are actually being healed. It is absolutely legitimate. Nobody doubts it. The word is spreading fast and furious so that the entire nation, plus already three listed foreign entities, are coming to press in around Jesus Christ. Period. At the end of verse 10. Period. Story ends. That's the end of the action sequence. That's the story Mark wants in our minds. Not a mention of teaching, response to his teaching, embracing of his identity, it is exclusively curiosity seekers, self-absorbed, self-loving hordes of people who naturally just want relief. They want their lives to be better. They want to be free of pain. They want the effects that Jesus can bring and does bring. End of story. The way the story is told should impress us. It's, it's actually very instructive. These, these folks are clamoring for healing. And think about it. The obvious implication here is There's nothing uniquely supernatural about the desire to be free of pain. We all naturally, every self-loving human being wants to be free of pain. There's nothing uniquely supernatural about the desire to have a better life. And there's nothing even wrong with wanting a better life. I mean, imagine the individuals in that crowd who were professionally trained, for example, as a carpenter or a stone uh, mason, and they have had some sort of accident that's ruined their ability to be, to be able to provide for their own family. They can't, even be, they can't even provide at a professional level anymore because of some sort of accident or some sort of injury in their profession. And to think, if I could get to Jesus, I could start providing for my family again. That's not even a wrong desire. It's just an inadequate desire response to Jesus. They are coming to Jesus because they want to get healed. This scene where they are pressing him and he has to get some distance from the audience and get in a little boat to get off the shore, it's almost like you know, like, uh, you, know, you, you look at some sort of like really ha- super popular uh, musical artist who just has a fan base clamoring at the front row, you know, swooning over some artist, like, oh my goodness, it's so-and-so, they're famous. That's, I don't think you can really overdo that with this scene here. They are clamoring for Christ because they're trying to touch him. If I touch him, I might be healed. I can go back and start up the business again. I can, be, I can start to provide for my family with that professional trade that I've already learned. The, the fact that Mark really ends the action sequence there is pretty profound because he's already showing where he ends up going in chapter 6, verse 6. Jesus just marvels at their unbelief. Here he is teaching, preaching, gospel, truth, eternity, hangs in the balance. Worship him for his identity and what he will do, and they are just seeking their own ends, wanting a better life. They're... Uh, Trust me, if, if, you, if you're hearing this and, and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, trust me when I say there are innumerable blessings that come from following Jesus Christ. To you, brothers and sisters in the room, our command is to bless the Lord, O oh my soul, forget none of his benefits. Forget none of his benefits. 
I mean, just to obey the commands and not forget any of them is going to take me eternity. And uh, I'm losing the mental capacity to keep up with the ones I would have listed out in the previous five minutes. I mean, it's just the, the benefits of Christ are limitless because he's that good and he's that kind. But the point of this story is to show us and remind us that to come to Christ for the benefits he gives us that naturally appeal to our self-loving fallen soul is never enough. It's always inadequate. Now, I pointed out that the action sequence ends there, but properly speaking, the, the whole story does not. Because in verse 11, it's as though Mark were writing the, the movie, the screenplay, let's say. Well, then verses 7 to 10 is kind of the action unfolding in film in front of us. We just watch that whole scene unfold. Uh, but what happens in verse 11 is more like we, the, scene, the scene stays on Jesus as he's out in the boat and people are clamoring to touch his clothing and it's just like this mob scene. And while that's happening, the voice of Mark comes over the audio and starts to explain something to make sense of what we're seeing. In verse 10 and 11, he actually changes the whole action sequence and starts, he puts all of this in the background to alert the reader, and it's hard to explain why in English, but the Greek ear would hear what Mark does in verses 11 and 12, and they would know he's given us background to make sense of verses 7 to 10. So when we switch to this second equally inadequate response, just notice and just recognize that it's actually not all inadequate responses are created equal. <laughs> okay, so the, the first inadequate response is inadequate. The second resp inadequate response is inadequate. But the first one is the one that Mark is documenting, and to show us how inadequate he is, he shows us a better response from unbelieving demons. Verse 11. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God! And he earnestly was warning them not to tell who he was. That's the voice of Mark explaining a theological reality that's important for us to understand the action sequence of verses 7 through 10. He does a play on words because in verse 10, when he's talking about the populace, the people, the crowds, he uses a word that means to fall upon, and the word to fall upon, it's translated pressed around. It's to fall upon. It's the same root with a different, a different prefix in verse 11 when it says they would fall down before him. The demons fall down before him. The people fall upon him. The people, the populace, are falling down upon him because they love themselves and they're curiosity seekers wanting healing. These demons are falling down before him out of reverence and out of Fear because they are afraid of who he is. They know his identity. These demons are falling before him, terrified. I didn't want to just use the simple word fear, fascination and fear, although that might sound good, and it's somewhat accurate. It's, I didn't want to confuse it with the virtue of fearing Christ and fearing God, which we all must do. This is being afraid of Christ, not, a, not the godly virtue of fear of Christ, this is being afraid of Christ because at least the demons fall down before him and shout, here's our phrase, you are the son of God. No humans? None of those wanting healing? They aren't saying it. The only people saying it, or the only things saying it, creatures saying it, are the demons. You are the son of God. This is profound. Son of God, we already saw it in chapter 1, verse 1. The gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the first time it shows up in the story, and it's on the lips of demons. Skip over to chapter 5, verse 7. You remember the story of the demoniac? He was living up in the cave, up on that hillside on the east side of the uh, Sea of Galilee. And uh, as he comes, as Jesus comes across in the boat and his disciples, they see him, he comes running down towards him. I mean, this guy, this guy would break chains. He would wreck shop on anybody walking by that way. They knew to avoid this guy's cave. They wouldn't even go near his hillside. Jesus just gets up on shore and he, this guy comes running down. He bows down. Look at verse six. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he runs up and bows down before him and 
he's shouting with a loud voice. He says, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. This demon recognizes his maker. He knows this is the son of God who has all authority and will at some point in the future torment him forever. I mean, the recognition of his identity is profound and it's complete. Chapter 3, demons. Chapter 5, another demon. And then it's not till chapter 15, verse 39, you finally see it on the lips of a human. Chapter 15, look at verse 39. When the centurion who was right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this, was, this man was the Son of God. What a profound gospel for the Christians in Rome. The Roman who said it first. Ironically, it comes, the story comes close to uh, people recognizing this and claiming this, but not quite. You have the blind man in chapter 10, verse 47 and 48, calling out, Son of David, have mercy on me. He starts calling him Son of David because he knows he's the Messiah. Um, you have demons calling him the Holy One of God, like chapter 1, verse 24, the demon in the synagogue called him the Holy One of God. Now, that's obviously a divine title, and if you read it, Isaiah 40 to 40, well, Isaiah 40 to 66, you can see that phrase used of both God the Father and God the Son, the suffering servant. The concept is throughout the book. Uh, for instance, in chapter 111, at Jesus' baptism, the Father speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved Son. At his transfiguration, chapter 9, verse 7, the, the, the same, sorry, the first one was chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, chapter 9, verse 7 is the transfiguration, same thing. God speaks from heaven, says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. In Mark chapter 13, verse 32, Jesus uh, calls himself the son as distinct from the father. And the high priest, ironically, asks a question rooted in skepticism and judgment and disdain and says, are you the son of the most high God? Jesus says, I am. And you'll see the son of man coming with glory. And alludes to Daniel 7, says, that's me. This is an incredible response. Look at these demons. I mean, it's not even that Mark puts them in front of us in an action sequence. It's Mark's voice just telling us as we're watching the failure of, this, of these people to respond properly. He's telling the, the, us as if we watched the movie Mark. Mark, as the narrator, is telling us, well, look, out, look at these demons. I mean, listen, the demons are actually doing this. They're falling down saying, you're the son of God. And he was warning them not to tell who he was. He does not need their unbelief as the source of their of his popularity. He, they are not his publicity agents. He doesn't need that kind of press. And so he's silencing the demons, and the contrast is profound. Listen, this story is the narrative equivalent of James chapter 2, verse 14 and following. I'm going to read this to you. Just listen as I, as I read this. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? You have orthodox faith in the nature and essence of God? You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. And they were shuddering in our story. But, James goes on to say, are you willing to recognize your foolish fellow that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, 
And as a result of the, of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. James is making a very clear point here. He's making the point that if you claim to have faith and it doesn't change anything in your life, your claim to faith is null and void. He's not even disagreeing with Paul. Paul says, you're, before God, you're exclusively justified by faith. And James says the same thing. He says, though, when you're claiming to have faith, you're actually only justified when you claim to a neighbor, hey, I've got faith. That's only a justified statement if it's proven by your works. This has been a very sober, and, and, and honestly, it's been a very critical and negative narrative. And Mark knows what he's doing. He's getting us to the positive. This is going to come in the next few weeks, but I don't, pastorally, I don't want to leave us there. There's nothing wrong with the way Mark told the story. It's perfect. But I'm going to go ahead and show you where it's going. Look at chapter 3, verse 13 through verse 19. Jesus picks his 12. You want to know what it looks like to follow after Christ? Listen to Christ's call and respond to him. He calls people after him so that, according to verse 14, he could, they could be with him and he could send them out to preach and have authority over demons. So they want, he wants time with them. He wants personal relationship with them. He wants to pour into them, and he wants them to be equipped to minister. That's part of what it means to follow Christ. Chapter 3, verses 20 to 35 is a, a profound story about Jesus' own family, the hometown crowd that comes from Nazareth, in verse 20 and 21, the hometown crowd is concerned that he's getting too popular. He's going to get um, nabbed. It's become aware to the populace that, you know what? The religious leaders want to kill this guy. So the, the, the hometown crowd is just thinking, ah, he's, he's gone too far. We're, we're going to help him out here. And Mark compares that so-called faith in Christ and loyalty to him. He contrasts that with the unbelief of the religious leaders, which is positively satanic in verses 22 to 30. And then in 31 to 35, picks it back up, and his mother, his brothers arrived. They're standing outside to basically apprehend him and say, come on home, you went too far. The crowd's standing around and said, look, your mother and brother are outside looking for you. And he said, who are my mother and my brothers? Verse 34, looking around at those who are sitting around him, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. Who are, his, who are his family? Those, it's not those who clamor for his benefits. It's not those who are looking for something selfishly from Christ. It's those who are sitting at his feet, listening to his words. Here's the real proof, verse 35. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. If you want to follow Christ in the way, it's not enough to follow him for all sorts of self-loving and natural motives. You've got to follow him because you want to sit at his feet, listen to his words, and do the will of his Father. So the question is, if you're following Christ on the way, you will see the fruit of him producing Christ-likeness in your life. Father, thank you for this story, which gives us a, an illustration of really what a spurious faith, faith looks like. And I just want to pray for anyone here, maybe, maybe even in a special way in light of this story, I want to pray for those who, are, who have been possibly thinking that they follow you um, and maybe a part of the church, but maybe they've never really pursued obedience to you. They, they, um, perhaps there are some who are well-churched, but are realizing that they really maybe enjoy the benefits that come from you rather than worshiping you and doing your will. And Lord, if there are any are confused by that, I just pray that you give them an opportunity to yield their will this week and to count the cost of worshiping you in the, in, the, in the quietness of their own heart, in the privacy of their own life, that they would be yielding their will to do your will. And even when cost comes and they count it a privilege to give you glory, that that would be an encouragement to them that their faith is real. It's something that you've produced. That, that to prefer even mockery at school or a demotion at work to embrace a more difficult life because of obedience to you 
It's such an incredible, incredible grace, Lord, to show us that we would gladly give up something that we would be self-seeking to hang on to, to give that up in order to do your will. That's the mark of a, of a disciple. But to keep pursuing you simply because of what we get, because we love ourselves, that could be a delusion. And so I pray, Lord, that none of us would be deluded with the crowd that we read about this morning, but that we would have a true, vigorous faith, that we would be following your Son on the way, on the path, even to suffering as he, you call us to. So, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for its power, and thank you for its clarity. In your name we pray this. Amen.